Good morning. Welcome to worship. Today we're going to talk about thin places and soul friends. And I know one of the things that reminds you that God is in this place is when you hear this bell ring. When it rings out on a Sunday morning, you think, ah, church has started. It's the sound of that rain that makes it so. It's the sound that calls us together. The bell is a thin place for you. I want you to stop now and look at some of my thin places, places where I've encountered God, and let those places remind you of the places where you've encountered God, where you've experienced the holy, right, present review. Our scripture this morning comes from Ruth 1, 6 through 18. Then she started to return with her daughter-in-laws from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had had consideration for God's people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughter-in-laws, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go back each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grants you that you may find security, each of you in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them and they wept aloud. They said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have some sons in my womb that may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said to her, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said to her, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more as well, if even if death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. Soul friends and thin places. You saw some of my thin places, places where I have encountered 
the living presence of God. And so when I go there, I experience a sense that this is holy, that this space is a place where I can be in touch with God. I'm sure you have your own thin places. Mine were this rock in Connecticut where I would go every day and sit down and meditate and pray as the water would stream down the stream on over the water fell, as the fish would swim. It was my place to center myself, to learn how to pray to God, to learn how to be with God. And then I showed you a picture of Pilgrim Park, the place where I had my first real life encounter with God in a way that changed me forever. It made me realize that God is real and true and, and the world is this wonderful creation that God has given us to explore and be in. Thin places. In the Celtic tradition, there is an understanding that there are spots where heaven and earth touch and meet. Where when you are at that spot, you are as likely to encounter the holy, the sacred, thin spaces. That's why while I wanted to preach outside today, because Celtic spirituality is a lot about the connection to earth, I know that this is a thin place for you. A place where God is present, where heaven and earth touch, where you encounter the holy, a thin spot. I thought in order for us to understand Celtic spirituality and these two concepts, thin places and soul friends, I'd focus on the Saint Bridget. St. Bridget's tale is that she was born of a chieftain and a slave. And that she, when it came to the point where they wanted to marry her off, decided that she wanted to give her life to God. And she founded in Ireland this monastery in Kildare where they light the flame, an eternal flame, that was lit from the time she built the monastery until the time King Henry VIII disbanded all monasteries. And we just restarted at the beginning of the, within the last hundred years. And at that spot where she chose, she picked a spot where they said she had, she kept going to the person who owned the land and asking for a place where she could have her monastery built. And they kept saying no to her, no, over and over again they would say no. And so she made them a deal. She said, if I can spread out my cloak far enough, can this space become our monastery. And so the apocryphal tale is that the nuns started pulling her cloak farther and farther apart and kept going farther and farther until they had the space for a monastery and for gardens and so much more. And so at that point, they called a halt and let her have that space. And it said that she, when she built that space, she built her room underneath one of the largest oak trees. She created a spot where men and women could gather to devote their life to God, to learn how to become connected to all that is sacred and holy, to learn what it meant to be in relationship to God. She created one of those spaces, one of the thin places where heaven and earth touch. There's a lot of stories told about St. Bridget. One of the stories that appealed to me was 
of how we got St. Bridget's cross. It's a cross that's made from the rushes and woven together. And tradition has it that a pagan chieftain was ill And they called Bridget to his side to teach him about Christ because they didn't want him to die without having been converted to Christianity. And so as she walked into that room, the man, the chieftain, was delirious and spouting. And, and Bridget sat down at his bedside to begin consoling him. And while doing so, she grabbed the rushes from the floor. They were meant to keep the floors clean and to help spread the warmth. And so she picked up some of those wretches and started weaving them together. And as she started weaving them together, it, looked a, it looks a bit like a God's eye. I'll put a picture so that you can see. And this cross of reeds, of rushes, as she wove it, she told him about Jesus about who Jesus was and the stories of his life. She began to explain what the cross was that she was making. And he began to be quiet and started asking her questions. And through her weaving that cross of rushes, she shared with him the life of faith. And she converted him and baptized him. St. Bridget has a lot to teach us about hospitality and taking care of the poor, for there are so many stories of her stopping to help the poor. There's one story told of a woman who was so happy to have experienced and been in the presence of Bridget that she had a bushel of apples and she brought them and gave them to Bridget. And then Bridget promptly gave them to everyone around her for who was in need. And the lady was all upset about the fact that those apples were supposed to be for St. Bridget. And yet Bridget saw those apples as a way to help someone else. One of the things that Celtic spirituality teaches us that I find fascinating is this idea of anamkara, of soul friends. Anamkara is that idea that there, there is a person for you, a person who is, acts as a teacher and companion and spiritual guide, a companion on your spiritual journey, someone that you confess to, that you reveal your most hidden intimacies, a person where you have no masks or pretensions. With the Anamkara, you share your innermost self, your mind and your heart. It's an, this friendship is an act of recognition and belonging. When you find your soul friend, you find your home. You're understood. A soul friend is a person who awakens your life in order to free you from the wild, for the wild possibilities that you have within. A soul friend. St. Bridget was known for being a soul friend to many and having a soul friend who was with her. There's a story told about when she realized that she was e reaching the end of her life and her soul friend was distraught and telling her that she was going to die just as she did. But Bridget wanted her soul friend to go on to be the head of the monastery. And so she made her promise that she wouldn't die because Bridget was dying. But there are stories told of them together often. But one of the stories I wanted to share with you about soul friends comes from a reading from the martyrology of Onagas the Kulde. A young cleric of the community of Ferns, a foster son of Bridget's, used to come to her with dainties. He was often with her in the refectory to partake of food. Once after going to communion, she strikes a clapper. Well, young cleric there, said Bridget, do you have a soul friend? 
I have, replied the young man. Let us sing his requiem, said Bridget. Why so, asked the young cleric. For he has died, said Bridget. When you had finished your half ration, I saw that he was dead. How did you know that? Easy to say, Bridget replies. From the time that your soul friend was dead, I saw that your food was put directly in the trunk of your body, since you were without any head. Go forth and eat nothing until you get a soul friend, for anyone without a soul friend is like a body without a head. She believed that it was important for all of us to have that experience of friendship, that experience of longing, that person that we could go to to talk about anything. That's why I chose for you the story of Ruth and Naomi. Because before the scripture reading, we had learned about Ruth, Naomi's family, that Naomi and her husband and sons had fled to Moab because there was a famine in the land, and at that time they could earn and eke out a living in Moab, and so they went there. And while there, the family grew older and got married, and then one tragedy after another strikes, and Naomi's husband dies, and then her two sons die. And Naomi decides that at that point, there's no point in being here where she's all alone, that she feels as if she's with and is with a foreign people that she doesn't belong. And so she decides to make the trek home, to make a pilgrimage back to the place she came from to die there in the land of her God. And so she sets out back for Judah with her two daughter-in-laws. And on the way, she stops and tells her two daughter-in-laws that they need to go back. They need to go back to their mother's house and find a new husband. And she prays on them that the Lord will deal kindly with you, like you have dealt with me and with the dead, and that they would find security. And she kisses them and they say, no, no, we don't want to go. But she pushes them to leave. And one of the daughters-in-law, Orpah, kisses Naomi goodbye and heads back to her family. But the other daughter-in-law, Ruth, doesn't want to do that. And so Naomi continues to argue with her about how there's no possibility that she's going to have any more children. And that she needs to really return to her family. Your sister-in-law did it. Now it's your turn. Return. But Ruth says to her, one of the passages of scripture that is so powerful, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more as well, even if death parts me from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your God, my God. Naomi and Ruth didn't just have a mother-daughter-in-law relationship because most of us know how that works out. She had a soul kinship. Ruth felt a soul kinship to Naomi. And so she wanted to be with her. She wanted to learn from her. And Ruth ends up teaching Naomi a lot about what friendship is about what you're willing to do to take care of another, about the sacrifices you're willing to make, about the places where you're willing to be. For Ruth and Naomi get to the new land, to the old land, to the homeland of Naomi, to the old house where they used to live. And Naomi realizes that they need to find Ruth a husband, and so they need to find the relative that would be best able to care for them. And the one they settle on is the one that had shown hospitality to Ruth and Naomi, who had let Ruth glean from the, the edges of the field 
and in fact invited those of his people who were harvesting to make sure that there was a lot left so that her and Naomi wouldn't starve. They worked out how to live in this land where they had no one who could protect them or take care of them. They found the people that could do that for them. They shared a deep friendship. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. A soul friend. A holy friendship. Pelagius wrote a letter that said, Indeed, we need one special friend who may be called a friend of the soul. We must open ourselves completely to this friend, hiding nothing and revealing everything. And we must allow this friend to assess and judge what the friend sees. A soul friend. A person who shows with you, shares with you, how you can find and be that best person. A person who shares with you and shows you how to be in better relationship with the sacred and the holy. A friend of your soul that gets you in a way that no one else does and ever will. A soul friend. So this week, I hope that you take time to Think about that. Think about who is that for you. That person that doesn't require you to put on masks. And I hope you take time to find that thin place. That place to go to one of your thin places. That spot where heaven and earth touch. Where you can experience all that is holy. Where you experience the presence of God. Amen. Bridget, the 5th century Irish saint, was famed for her hospitality. The following prayer is attributed to her. As we recite it, let us consider our need to be God's hospitality to others. I should like a great lake of finest ale for the king of kings. I should like a table of choicest food for the family of heaven. Let the ale be made from the fruits of faith, the food be forgiving love. I should welcome the poor to my feast, for they are God's children. I should welcome the sick to my feast, for they are God's joy. Let the poor sit with Jesus at the highest place, and the sick dance with the angels. God bless the poor, God bless the sick, and bless our human race. God bless our food, God bless our drink. All homes, O oh God, embrace. I open my heart to Christ in the stranger, to Christ in the face of colleague and friend. I open my heart to the one who is wounded, to Christ in the hungry, the lonely, the homeless. I open my heart to the one who has hurt me, to Christ in the face of sinner and foe. I open my heart to those who are outcast, to Christ in the broken, the prisoner, the poor, I open my heart to all who are searching, to Christ in the world, God's generous gift. As we pray together the prayer that your son taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. mission offering this month goes to strengthen the church. It's the offering that is used to support our Native American ministries, it's used to support youth ministries, and it's used to help revitalize and renew congregations. I hope that you give generously. So I wanted to share with you a story about St. Bridget. There's a story of a poor man who asked St. Bridges for a small amount of honey. She expressed her sorrow that she had none to give, but then she heard the hum of bees coming from beneath the floor of the house. When they dug into the place of the noise, they found enough honey to give to the man who received the gift with thanks and went on his way rejoicing. So this is that time when I ask you to dig beneath the floorboards for that honey that can make a difference in someone's life, that can bring joy and hope and light, that can show people where the thin places on earth are and help them to find a soul friend. So I invite you to give generously to our church that we may continue to be that place, those people. Let us pray. Holy God, let us dig through the floors that we have to find the honey that may be the nourishment and desire of the one that is in front of us. Help us to share our gifts that they may be used for your good here on earth. Amen. I want to leave with you one of the Celtic blessings. Christ is a light, illumine and guide us. Christ is a shield, overshadow us. Christ under me, Christ over us, Christ beside us on our left and our right. This day be within and without us, lowly and meek and yet all powerful. 
be in the heart of each of whom we speak, in the mouth of each who speaks to us. This day be within and without us, lowly and meek, yet all powerful. Christ as a light, Christ as a shield, Christ beside us and on our left and on our right. And if nobody told you today that I love you, remember that God loves you and always will. That Jesus loves you and always will. That I love you and always will. May you make time to be in your thin place. May you ask God to share with you and bring you an anamkara. Amen. Thank you.